Okay, well, hello and welcome to today's webinar being hosted by the Arab Reform Initiative. Uh, today's discussion is titled Diaspora Activism versus Authoritarian Regimes. Um, and this is actually the second in our series of webinars under the collective title, The New Arab Diasporas. This is a series of discussions that we're gonna be hosting over the next few months um, with both uh, academics and experts on the subject of diaspora studies and transnational politics, as well as with diaspora activists themselves and with um, organizations in diaspora, in MENA diasporas. Um, and the, the, the series is gonna be looking at a lot of the transformations we're seeing in MENA diaspora since 2011, both in terms of the, um, the demographics of these diasporas, who is in these diasporas, the reasons for their departure, where they are going, but also how the patterns of mobilization have been changing and the different factors that mediate these changes in mobilization, both with regards to uh, home countries and how the nature of conflicts and the reasons for departure are affecting mobilization, but also in terms of um, in terms of host societies themselves and the different opportunities and constraints. And what we're particularly interested in exploring are the various forms of political remittances um, and how these are moving really in both directions, both towards home countries, but also in host societies, whether at the national level or even at the very local level. Um, so today's is, as I said, this is the second in this discussion, and I'm very excited today to be joined by Dr. Dana Moss. Uh, she is an assistant professor of sociology at the University of Notre Dame um, and has written extensively on this subject in the field of diaspora studies and on transnationalism in general. Um, and one of the, the things she specializes in is the issue of transnational repression. She's done extensive field work and written some very impressive scholarly articles on this subject, both how transnational repression works, how these authoritarian reach can go quite far uh, and its effect on those in diaspora, but also how uh, people in diaspora can overcome this transnational oppression and actually undertake various forms of, of activism and forms of anti-regime advocacy. And this is a really important issue and I think a really timely one. Um, obviously, the issue of transnational oppression, what we've been seeing um, historically, but also certainly since 2011, it has continued. This is not something that has stopped. There are, of course, the very famous cases, those that kind of grab headlines of murders committed against opponents that speak out despite being uh, abroad. Uh, but also, I think for many of us, we've all had the experience of being, for example, at a conference and being with colleagues um, from different countries in the region who are maybe not comfortable speaking, maybe don't want to participate in a discussion, or maybe slightly change their research agenda because they themselves know that the surveillance systems are listening and they don't feel comfortable anymore. And so I think this is something that many people are facing and that is um, affecting both those in diaspora, but also um, the research community more broadly. And so I think it's a really important issue to be uh, discussing. So I'm really excited to have this discussion with you today, Dana. Um, before we start, um, I'm just going to have some housekeeping issues. So um, Dana will make a presentation and she does have a, some slides to show us. Um, and then we will turn it over to the floor for discussion. So for those joining us on Zoom, you can use the Q&A um, function and we will be uh, reading those questions. And for those joining us on Facebook Live, uh, you can simply type your questions into the comments section. Those will be, those will also be uh, transferred to us. Um, so thank you very much, Dana, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for having me, Sarah, Andrew, um, uh, Saeed, everybody at uh, the Arab Reform Initiative. It was a delight to get the invitation to talk to you about this today. Now, this may um, honestly be the wrong audience for this kind of talk. The, what I'm about to talk about may be quite apparent and obvious um, to those of you tuning in, but I hope that uh, you know it will at least be an interesting discussion and uh, we can go from there. Um, okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Thanks for bearing with me. All right. Sarah, can you give me a thumbs up if that looks okay? Awesome. Okay, great. So 
Uh, my work today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about a book project that I am finishing up for Cambridge University Press on the Arab Spring Abroad, specifically looking at three communities across two different host countries or countries in the Western world, um, the US and Great Britain, and talking about how authoritarian uh, regimes impact diasporas and also how diasporas were um, attempting to and in sometimes very much successfully influencing the Arab Spring revolutions. Now for those of you tuning in, I'm sure that uh, this is all still feels very fresh for you as it does for me, but it's hard to believe now that the Arab Spring uprisings or what we call the Arab Spring uprisings happened almost 10 years ago. So as a refresher, they started in Tunisia and then spread to Egypt, uh, Bahrain, Syria, Yemen, and Libya with very different outcomes in each case. Now, during that time of the sort of peak Arab Spring, I was stuck in Jordan because I couldn't get to where I was intending to be in Yemen. But when I returned home uh, as a graduate student at the University of California in Irvine, all the way uh, in Los Angeles, I noticed that the Arab Spring was also going global and oftentimes almost literally reaching my backyard. So I was noticing that Libyan, Syrians, and Yemenis were coming out and coming together in new ways, uh, at least in ways that they had never before witnessed in their lifetime to protest against the regimes and to try to support the Arab Spring uprisings. Now, transnational mobilization, as Sarah mentioned, matters a lot. Um, both transnational movements and diasporas in particular channel a lot of different types of resources homewards, um, and these can have a lot of political implications. So they can channel media attention, they can channel remittances to conflicts, and oftentimes they're propping up humanitarian uh, relief efforts in response to crises and disasters. And this has led pundits ranging from uh, Benedict Anderson on the one hand uh, to Samuel Huntington to warn us that actually diasporas are, can be quite powerful, particularly when they're situated in geopolitical, uh, geopolitically important host countries like the United States, they, they, that they can influence foreign policy and that they can potentially stir up conflicts in the home country. So there's been so much growing attention to the role of diasporas in international affairs and in home country conflicts and development that a lot of times they've been sort of blamed or had the finger pointed them as being these very powerful and unencumbered long distance nationalists because abroad they're supposedly safe to serve circulate weapons and propaganda and other kinds of materials and remittances back home. That's what the literature says. But this led me to ask uh, questions because it really wasn't clear from the existing studies that were out there at the time when diaspora movements actually come out to contest authoritarianism in their places of origin, the other or different kinds of obstacles that stand in their way, and also the very different roles that they play in these conflicts. I mentioned uh, my forthcoming book, which I hope will be out about this time next year, is addressing these questions. And in the book, I talk about three cases, as I mentioned, Libyan, Syrians, and Yemenis in the US and in Great Britain. And this is just some background information about their populations um, and the size of their communities. Now, for the purposes of the presentation today, I'm really just going to be talking about the Libyan and Syrian communities, and we can talk about why that is in the Q&A, if it's of interest to anybody, and what was going on with the Yemenis. So for, as a basis for this research, I'm not going to go into depth in terms of my data and methods, although I'm happy to answer more questions about that later on. I conducted about 240 in-depth interviews between 2011 and 2014 across various uh, formal and informal social movements and organizations across the US and Great Britain, both uh, in person and over Skype before we were all using Zoom and so you know savvy in technology. So I found that through my research and investigation that there were two main mechanisms that really deterred, you know, what Albert Hirschman, the, this famous economist called voice after exit. So when these communities came out and became visible anti-authoritarian movements in their host countries. And the first mechanism is what I'm gonna be presenting on today, this phenomenon I call transnational repression, which is in general an effort by home country regimes and their agents and their loyalists 
to silence dissent in the diaspora and sometimes to punish dissenters for daring to speak out. Now, the reason I'm focusing primarily on the Libyan and Syrian cases today is because I found that before the Arab Spring, this deterrent was primarily affecting these communities. Yemeni regime at the time under Ali Abdullah Saleh tried to suppress voice in the diaspora, but his regime was too weak to really succeed in doing that. So that's why I'm focusing on these cases. And there was also another mechanism at play, which we can talk about later if you like, um, which I call conflict transmission. This refers to the ways in which home country conflicts, such as between southern Yemenis and northern Yemenis, uh, were transmitted to diaspora communities through their biographical and identity-based ties. So in terms of splitting the diaspora and creating factionalism and conflicts, this was another reason why the diasporas were undermobilized prior to the Arab Spring. But again, I'm going to save that for another time because uh, we don't have a ton of time today. So in terms of talking about transnational repression, again, a lot of you may already be familiar with some of these practices. But for those of you who aren't, uh, before 2011, I found that the Syrian and Libyan regimes imposed a lot of robust costs on diaspora activism, even doing something as simple as posting something that was anti-regime on Facebook or participating in a peaceful vigil or demonstration prior to 2011. Now, as we all know, with the case of Jamal Khashoggi, the Saudi journalist dissident who was murdered by um, uh, MBS in, in Istanbul, uh, sometimes regimes do assassinate their opponents abroad. And in fact, Muammar Gaddafi in the 1980s and 1990s initiated an international assassination program to eliminate what he called the stray dogs abroad. And he actually succeeded in murdering many dissidents in the UK, particularly in London and across Europe. A few of these assassinations were attempted in the US. Um, he, as far as we know, he didn't succeed. We also know that the CIA and FBI were, were tracking this. Um, but uh, this is actually, of course, one way that regimes signal to the diaspora what is possible if they dare to speak out or if they dare to seek refuge abroad. It's also probably the rarest form of transnational repression. Nevertheless, it sends a strong signal to people that the regime is watching you in the diaspora. We also know that uh, regimes have renditioned people. Uh, Gaddafi renditioned uh, NSFL dissidents from Cairo, for example, back home for torture and interrogation and murder execution. Uh, so regimes oftentimes have agreements with other countries to uh, render suspects back home. But also the regimes can quite easily send death and rape threats to uh, dissidents abroad. They've done so online, they've done so in person. This is quite scary for members of the diaspora. We also know that the regime surveilled diasporas through uh, social media and other kinds of phishing and malware, spyware on their computers. But in addition, there's a lot of surveillance that goes on in person, which I witnessed actually uh, attending Syrian protest events in late 2011. You had uh, pro-Assad loyalists uh, filming uh, people as they were protesting against the regime. And it was actually the case that some of these people were sending the surveillance back home and getting people and their family members in trouble. Regimes also uh, suspend student scholarships when they don't go out to protest for the regimes. Um, so this happened when Muammar Gaddafi visited the United Nations in New York. The regime sent missives to students across the US saying you need to come to New York to protest in support of Gaddafi. And if you don't, we'll take your scholarships away. This also happened during the Arab Spring and it also happened among Syrians all over the world. Uh, regimes can also impose exile on people who are not already exiled. So of course, many Syrians and Libyans were maintaining contacts and travel to and from their home country to visit their relatives, their parents, their properties. Um, but sometimes they would get word that they had done something to irritate the regime and they were stuck abroad and they weren't able to travel home without being risk of kidnapped from the airport and essentially potentially disappeared. And probably the most effective way that regimes repress their diasporas is by harming their significant others at home, which is, or threatening to do so, which is what I call proxy punishment. So I'll give you an example of that in a minute. 
I do also want to mention that in the past three years or so, there's also been a, a rise in research on how regimes are using Interpol and putting red notices on their opponents to prevent them from claiming asylum abroad and achieving safety. And all of these tactics um, have been used by a range of regimes and are being used by a range of regimes outside and inside of the Middle East today. I didn't specifically find instances of Interpol red notices being used against dissidents prior to 2011. However, that doesn't mean that it wasn't happening. And this is a practice that is currently on the rise. And uh, there are certain institutions and political agents within the United States trying to reform this, but it's very difficult. So one example of proxy punishment that you may have heard of at the beginning of 2011 was when Malik Jandali, who's a Syrian musician, performed a concert in Washington, D.C. in the summer uh, simply to call for freedom in his homeland. He didn't mention the Assad regime by name. Uh, he didn't call for support of the revolution or say a shab yuri the scat the nizam. However, uh, as a result specifically of him daring to call for freedom in Syria, his parents were kidnapped. They were brutalized in their home and they were told we're going to teach you how to raise your son by the agents who brutalized them. So it was clear that his parents in this case paid the price for his voice abroad. And this case became very well known and stoked a lot of fear among Syrians even as the revolution was escalating. And this is the kind of thing that people are primarily worried about who have ties to their home countries. Now, this had a lot of effects. This uh, transnational repression had a lot of effects in terms of deterring and undermining the ability of diaspora movements to embrace their political rights and embrace their civil liberties in their host countries abroad. Uh, one thing that happened was that I found lots of stories about fear and mistrust and division in the diaspora because essentially people were worried that they didn't know who was spying on them. So Nibal told me from London, you know, the regime really made us fear each other because, you know, I might be able to get together with a fellow group of Syrian students, but you don't know who works for the regime. You don't know who's writing reports on you. And this really had an effect on whether they felt that they could speak out or not. And Sarah likewise told me, who's a, a Libyan, uh, British Libyan living outside London at the time, that you know, if I saw somebody who I knew was Libyan on the street, I would cross over. If I didn't already know them through their family context, I would never just go talk to somebody you didn't know. You're willing to keep your head down because you want to protect your family in Libya and you want to go back to Libya. You don't want to be on some kind of watch list or on their radar. So even consorting with their co-nationals could put people at risk. And this rendered them either unable to talk politics amongst themselves or made folks completely avoidant of their co-nationals abroad. And some, some Libyans actually told me, you know, we identified as Arab and we identified as Jordanian because that was safe, but we never told people that we were Libyan. This obviously also limited their free speech and civic life, even in places as far away as Los Angeles. So Ayman told me, you know, we'd never be able to speak in front of Syrians who were affiliated with the regime or who we thought were affiliated with the regime openly about anything having to do with home country politics or Assad for fear for ourselves because we were going regularly back home or for our families. And anytime diasporas formed associations, this was either directly a part of and co-opted by the regime or assumed to be a part of this authoritarian infrastructure that reached abroad. So there were attempts primarily around what we call the Damascus Spring in 2005 uh, for Syrian intellectuals abroad, particularly in the United States, to try to form new organizations to say, let's talk about democratic reform and you know, um, a liberalization ending the emergency law in Syria. Um, and we're not gonna criticize the regime, we're just gonna talk about reform. So a group of these guys formed the Syrian American Council in 2005. And when I asked them about that, they said, oh my God, it was, it was Basically, it, it was a failed attempt to mobilize because everyone was afraid to join. The consequences could be very severe still if you were visiting Syria and the intelligence might visit your family in Syria. So the American uh, Council, the Syrian American Council around this time couldn't recruit a grassroots base and became largely dormant until the Arab Spring revived it. So as Kinan told me, no organization abroad could operate independently of the Syrian government. You know, we had no independent civil society, even though technically we were free Americans or Britons uh, where we were living. <laughs> 
Another thing was that, of course, there were exiles in these communities at this time who were not afraid to speak out against the regime, but the threats of transnational repression in their communities more broadly constrained their abilities to mobilize recruits and to speak out and to forge community organizations. Sarab told me from New York that, you know, being publicly anti-regime was really fringe. It was really limited to people who had already incurred incredible costs and sacrifices in the home country and were not afraid, but the rest of the community, not so much. So during this time, there were opposition groups that were trying to be vocal in terms of bringing the world's attention to abuses happening in the home country, but they lacked support from their own community. And Faraz told me, he said, I was one of these guys. I stayed away from the classic opposition. You know someone from the regime is observing them, and you don't want to be in any way, shape, or form associated with them as individuals or in terms of their activities. And Hamid, who was a, 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 a dissident who, whose family had a long history of repression from Gaddafi and was not scared of Gaddafi from abroad, said, a lot of the Libyans I knew were scared. If I try to talk to them to say, hey, Gaddafi this, everybody was like, shut up. I don't even want to hang around with you if you're going to talk about Gaddafi because they were scared. So the point is, is that there were actually no public anti-regime organizations or lobbies in either of these communities, in either of these host countries before 2011 changed the situation. So transnational repression had a massive deterrent effect on civil liberties and voice in the diaspora prior to the uprisings. Now there's a lot I could say about why the Arab Spring changed this, but very briefly, the Arab Spring revolutions in Syria and Libya really upset this deterrent effect uh, for a few reasons. The first is that uh, uh, their family members back in the home country oftentimes became embroiled in the conflict. So people whose family members were out protesting in Benghazi and getting shot no longer needed members of the diaspora to, say, to stay quiet to protect them because they were already joining in the struggle or they were already being victimized by the regimes. So when family members at home became embroiled in the conflict in some way, shape, or form, or in the uprisings, people abroad felt more liberated to come out because they were no longer responsible for keeping people safe at home. That often occurred. Another thing was that, you know, people often said, uh, you know, I, I, yes, I understand that I'm partly responsible for my family's safety at home, but I can't just stay quiet anymore. Uh, a lot of Syrians, for example, reference the horrible case of Hamza al-Khatib, the 13-year-old boy from uh, Dara, I believe, who was tortured to death by Syrian forces early on in the revolution. His case, which was circulated, he became you know, a very well-known victim of the regime uh, during the early days of the Arab Spring. His case specifically motivated a lot of people to say, look, I have to do something. This isn't just about me and my family anymore. This is about the victimization of us as Syrians, as a community, we need to fight back to say something. And then, of course, at the same time that the regimes were stoking this kind of support, both at home and abroad through mass murder, we see examples of that here on my screen, also targeted repression in the diaspora became less likely as the regimes turned to fight wars and insurgencies and rebellions in their home country. So, uh, and in some cases, the embassies and the consulates and the kind of infrastructure that the regimes had in place abroad to monitor the diaspora also imploded. So very early on, the uh, Libyan ambassador to Washington DC defected. So all of, and the students were, you know, coming out because they were morally outraged. So Libyans in DC were saying, well, then, you know, we have no fear anymore. We're going to come out and join this as well. So the were several reasons why the Arab Spring upset this deterrent. Uh, however, I do want to emphasize, and I don't have time to fully go into it now, but I do want to emphasize that because uh, the revolution erupted and spread nationwide in Libya very quickly. This occurred very quickly in the Libyan diaspora. Now, as we know, in the Syrian case, the revolution uh, spread very gradually over the course of the country. Um, different groups on the ground were engaged in different tactics. Sometimes they didn't agree. It depended, for example, how you were affected, whether your family was in Damascus or in Homs or in Aleppo or in Banyas. So the very pace in the revolutions and in the insurgencies in Libya and Syria had a corresponding effect in terms of how quickly people felt liberated to come out and say something. And because some people's families in Syria, uh, by the time I interviewed them in 2014, were still living in places 
that were under regime control. Many people as of 2014 kept their anti-regime sentiments to themselves. However, by 2014, there were a certain threshold that had a, been reached, in which case a, you know, a, a critical mass of people in the Syrian diaspora had said, okay, we've had enough, we're gonna come out and say something. But the pace of this process and this upending of these deterrents was different in these cases. So I do wanna acknowledge that. Now, in terms of what, and I'll be quick, in terms of what the um, diasporas actually did in the revolutions, I found that there were, and let me just go through this quickly now, five main tactics and ways that they intervened. First, they connected with people on the ground to broadcast what was happening in places that didn't have independent media coverage to the outside world. They did that online, they did that in person, they issued uh, reports. They also represented the revolution. So for example, the Libyan Emergency Task Force, the Syrian Emergency Task Force, they are acting as proxies for revolutionaries and bringing their grievances and their demands to members of the US government, for example. They also brokered, so they also forged ties between revolutionaries on the ground and people abroad, such as Anderson Cooper on CNN. And this is one of the ways in which diasporas can sort of live in two worlds at once and create these connections that people in who have been living in totalitarian like societies um, don't have. And they also remitted, I think Syrians have remitted to date over half of a billion dollars to humanitarian relief uh, to address relief, particularly in places that are being underserved or not served at all by the international humanitarian community. So there was a lot of remittances going on. And then also people also went back home to their home countries to volunteer, whether to fight or be, you know, volunteering as for medical relief or to actually even serve in Libya's National Transitional Council or Syrian's interim government or what have you. So there are a lot of different ways in which diaspora voice mattered for the Arab Spring. It mattered that they participated and came out and overcame these effects of transnational repression. So just to conclude, basically to say diaspora activism is impactful and can be very impactful. It can threaten regime power, it can threaten regime censorship, uh, and it can expose crimes and atrocities that are going on in the home country, and it can also support life-saving humanitarianism. But I found that scholars, by pointing the fingers at diasporas, uh, just by actually looking at a few pretty unique cases, have been quite overly optimistic about the extent to which diaspora members just have the freedom to mobilize from abroad willy-nilly. Uh, diasporas are embedded simultaneously both in their home countries or their places of origin and in the places abroad where they live. So the ties that actually should enable them to mobilize uh, in the home country can actually embed them in repressive relationships. So authoritarianism operates transnationally and this isn't a new phenomenon in history but it's actually one that researchers like myself are just starting to publish about in the last five years. And we could use a lot more syst systematic comparisons and we need a lot more data on the extent to which regimes are effectively repressing voice abroad. Now, I briefly mentioned Jamal Khashoggi. Everyone's heard of his case. I want to direct your attention if you're interested in learning more about this, to a recent report published by Freedom House, which I contributed to, as well as um, several amazing scholars who have done a lot of work on this in different parts of the world called Perspectives on Everyday Transnational Repression in the Age of Globalization. Uh, so uh, this report is free online. You could just Google Transnational Repression Freedom House and it'll come right up. And you can also see works by some of the authors that I list here who are doing really important on work on different dimensions of transnational repression, whether that be surveillance and kidnappings or the use of Interpol by regimes. So thank you all very much for having me. Okay. Thank you so much, Dana. That was an incredibly rich uh, presentation, um, both conceptually, but also really in the, uh, the details of the empirical cases. Um, so we really do feel those voices um, through your presentation. Um, before I turn it over to the floor, I am gonna um, ask you just a few questions. Um, the first is about shifts in transnational oppression that we're seeing from uh, Libya and Syria today, given the way the conflict dynamics have changed, obviously. Um, you know, in the case of Syria, what we've seen is that the regime has very much been able to consolidate its power, um, 
largely through um, outside intervention, of course, but that the regime is not in any way had to relinquish its repressive capacity. On the contrary, has been able to reinforce it. So I'm wondering if we are seeing um, rising repression on the part of the Syrian regime, or perhaps um, it perhaps it's less effective because many people now feel there is no chance for going back actually. And on the flip side of that, is the case of the Libyans. Um, you know, what we see now is that uh, it's a very unclear status. We're in this protracted conflict. It's difficult to imagine how it's going to end. Uh, we have multiple centers of power, different governments, and there's not a clear military victory in sight at this stage. And so I'm wondering how that has shifted the repressive capacity uh, on Libyans uh, abroad, Libyans in diaspora. And then as a related question, a second question, it's from the other side, which is how this is affecting transnational mobilization of these two communities. Um, you know, one of the things that we had talked about last week during the, the webinar we held was uh, about how, how a conflict ends actually determines how um, and when diasporas can mobilize. That it's very de determined by you know, who are the, the winners and losers of the conflict and what are the needs. And so given that in Syria, um, we can see who the likely winner of this conflict is. Uh, does that, for example, increase the moral obligation in maybe the sector where people mobilize? For example, maybe people feel, well, now we need to um, work on transitional justice more because that's our only avenue at this point. Whereas in the case of Libya, maybe there's a feeling that we can still have some advocacy efforts to um, promote the UN process or promote national reconciliation. So I'm wondering the, where these conflicts are heading, how that's also affecting um, the thinking of these communities in terms of where their transnational mobilization should be, should be directed. Great question, Sarah, thank you. Um, I think, you know, embedded in those questions are, are two parts. And one is about the willingness of people to mobilize now, their, their motivations and their commitment to this. And the other is about what tactics they're using given the evolution of the conflict. So let me just address those two briefly, as if I may. Now, um, in the second part of the book, I talk about the fact that the extent to which diaspora activists and their movements are able to intervene is really determined by two main things. So once they've come out and once they've come together and overcome, you know, the deterrent effects of transnational repression, well, then what determines the extent to which they can intervene? And it's really about resources, the resources that they can convert and amass and gain and channel to the conflict and into their mobilization activities. And it's also really about the extent to which they gain geopolitical support. That's not only important for, for them to have access to political institutions and do lobbying uh, and to participate in you know, political processes or, or participate at the United Nations, but also it's very important for them to be able to move resources homeward. If, you're, if your government says, no, you moving resources into Syria is supporting terrorism, right, then you're gonna be blocked in terms of what you can do as a diaspora movement there. So right now the situation is incredibly tough for diaspora mobilization, as you mentioned, for a few reasons. In Libya, you do not have clear good guys and bad guys in the conflict. Um, what's interesting actually is Hiftar is a member of the diaspora himself. So he's also like one of these guys that's sort of a diaspora, meddler par excellence, you know, who can come in and wreak havoc, unfortunately. What we what I've seen with the Libyan diaspora is after the fall of Gaddafi, a lot of people from the diaspora either said, okay, I'm going to get back to my life abroad and, you know, get my medical degree and finish my law school and, and, and do whatever I need to do or live out my retirement, right? But like, I helped and I want to help more, but I'm going to continue with my life. And a lot of other people actually went back to Libya to participate in nation building processes in civil society. And I met a lot of those people when I went to Tripoli and the surrounding areas in 2013. Of course, since then, the civil conflict has pushed most of those people back out. And it's created even more tensions between people who have been stuck in Libya and people who have, or the double shafras as they call them, the people who can, you know, have the passports and have the means to, to come in and out of Libya and go abroad to safety. So this has created a lot of problems. Now, every political conflict, as you mentioned, uh, creates its new a new wave of exiles. So I can imagine that whoever takes power in Libya is going to have a lot of say in terms of who's allowed back in to the country. And this is going to have a huge implication for sort of the next generation of transnational repression and 
uh, diaspora mobilization. At this point, though, I think the main obstacle to both is the fractured nature of the conflict, the inability to really, you know, contribute in a substantive or concrete way to positive social change on the ground, and the fragmentation in the community about what the solutions to this actually should be. So I've seen a radical, I mean, with very few exceptions, a radical demobilization of the Libyan diaspora. And also, you know, a lot of the prominent civil society people in Libya have been murdered. Uh, so I imagine those who could get out have gotten out and, uh, but I don't see a lot of collective mobilization like we saw for the Arab Spring against Gaddafi, something that some people have been waiting generations to participate in. Now regarding um, the Syrians, of course, the Assad regime with you know, the help of Russia, which is very important because Russia is one of sort of the primary um, harbingers of transnational repression in the world today with its technological capacity, surveillance, trolling, and all the rest of it, has, I think, managed to redeter a lot of people who for a time felt empowered to come out against the regime. And of course, it's because they're scared to death all over again. They're scared for their families and they're scared for themselves. I think though, as you mentioned, a lot of people said, look, it's too late. The regime, if they wanna know who I am, there's a year's worth of footage on YouTube and on my social media about my activism and what I've been involved in. And it's kind of too late for me. There are still some incredibly I think heroic efforts going on in the diaspora, of course, not, not controversial ones. There's the Caesar Act, the Syrian Emergency Task Force. There are still a lot of humanitarian projects going on uh, for people, for refugees especially. Um, but I think that this has been happening against all odds because the diaspora's resources have been diminished by the extent and just the extreme needs of people and of Syrians and of their families who are oftentimes spread all over the world and unemployed and, and what have you. And um, also the lack of geopolitical support for any kind of a, a real alternative to Assad at this point, um, and particularly in the US and Great Britain. So it's gonna be a massive challenge and is a massive challenge for people. There is still some mobilization, but now it's being deterred by, I'd say all four of the mechanisms that my book identifies, resurgent transnational repression, resurgent conflict transmission within the diaspora, so disagreement within the diaspora about what to do, a lack of geopolitical support for real solutions and for aid, getting aid on the ground, and also resource depletion, because at this point, uh, communities are both uh, emotionally and sort of financially exhausted. So I think we're gonna see another sort of period of abeyance in diaspora mobilization for the time being. Like I said, though, with certain important exceptions and the people who are still pounding the pavement every day, they're, they're unfortunately, I think, the minority at this point. Okay, thanks. And actually, your comments about Russia lead us right to one of the other, one of the questions that have been posed by a member of our audience, which is about um, the authoritarian regimes that have a stake in these conflicts. Um, you cited Russia, but we also have Turkey, Iran, United Arab Emirates, others. Are, are we seeing any efforts on their part uh, to either carry out this form of transnational repression or at least lend resources to do so, whether it's surveillance systems or other? Great question. I think that there is a huge possibility of this, but concrete examples, sometimes they're hard to come by. We know, for example, that some uh, Israeli spyware called Pegasus has been used by Bahrain and other countries to spy on dissidents both in the country and in the diaspora. And that you know, has created a little bit of a scandal that people at Citizen Lab and other places are talking about in terms of what specifically the Russian regime or other regimes might be doing to surveil or persecute the diaspora. I'm not sure. However, I'd be surprised if there wasn't something happening because the, the Russian regime has a much greater capacity to hunt out, root out and identify and spy on on enemies, you know, however they're defined, writ large, than the Syrian regime does right now, which would essentially collapse without Russian support, in my view. So I imagine that, you know, because these technologies are exchanged between regimes, they're exchanged between corporations and regimes, sometimes they go through a third party in order to get, uh, uh, you know, bypass laws that prevent this kind of transmission. Um, 
that the Syrian regime is really probably going to be relying on the Russian regime for help in this effort. However, because the regime has been significantly weakened through this conflict, uh, I imagine that the situation for people is probably a bit like, I don't know how much danger I'm in. And unfortunately, that's what it's like living in an authoritarian context in general. You don't really know when or how often you know, people are listening. Um, it, it's sometimes up to a lot of guesswork. What that means is probably that a lot of people in the diaspora are erring on the side of caution and rescinding their sort of public face of their regime opposition. There have also been some very suspicious murders in Turkey and Germany of Syrian activists um, that people haven't necessarily been able to pin on regime agents themselves, but are very likely politically motivated. And because assassinations don't necessarily have to take place by bodyguards, you know, they can take place by uh, unfortunately, agents and basically hired guns. Um, this is probably creating a lot of fear in these communities all over again. And um, I, so I imagine there's a big mix of effects going on right now. I do worry that um, with a regime like Russia, just with no scruples that I can see, uh, that yeah, the Syrian the Syrian diaspora will continue continue to be in danger, albeit from their tech, you know, from a more equipped global power rather than just the Syrian regime itself. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we have another question about um, what's happening within the host countries where these migrants are settled, and to what extent are they protecting? Uh, activists or enabling their activism and trying to protect them from these various forms of transnational repression? Um, or in certain cases, are they either turning a blind eye or perhaps facilitating it through the sale of communications technologies, for example? So if you could, if you have any evidence of that about, I mean, especially for those who are maybe in um, ostensibly democratic or free countries, I mean, what are they, what is being done to protect um, these new citizens or these new, um, Asylum seekers. Uh, you're muted. Dana. This is a great, sorry, this is a great question and something that my uh, colleague Sapira Furstenberg at the University of Exeter and I are going to be writing on in a new volume on transnational repression because there hasn't been so much attention in this new field of research to host country responses. Like, what are they doing about this? So let me answer this in two ways. Let me first share an image. Um, so hopefully you all can see this image here. Oh, there we go. Can you see that, Sarah? Great, okay. So this image refers to a specific case that was prosecuted by the FBI in the United States in 2012 against Mohammed Swaid. Uh, Mohammed Swaid was a man living in Northern Virginia around the DC community uh, who was caught filming and recording the names, identifications of Syrians who were anti-regime and coming out as anti-regime in that community. And you can see him here literally video recording, right? This is before we all had the right cell phones for this, I guess, video recording uh, his opponents on the street. Now it was actually discovered that he was directly flying back to Syria to share this intelligence with the regime and people's family members were being harmed. So the FBI prosecuted him as being an, un an uh, unlawful, illegal uh, foreign agent for a foreign government and putting people at risk. And so um, to that extent, he did get, I believe, an 18, oh, sorry, I'm just trying to unshare the screen now. Um, he did get an 18 month prison sentence for this situation. So it's not that it's not that regimes or governments like in the United States or Great Britain allow this. I think that fundamentally transnational repression threatens a government's sovereignty. And so they have a general incentive to make sure that this isn't happening. I mean, when Erdogan's bodyguards were beating up Kurdish protesters in Washington DC a few years ago, that was incredibly embarrassing and something that even, you know, the Trump administration said, you know, can't happen. But the problem is, is that it's very, very difficult to, to prevent uh, some of the more mundane and routine forms of transnational repression occurring in the diaspora, uh, people who work in the embassy who coordinate a lot of this repression oftentimes have diplomatic immunity, which makes it very difficult. And so it's only until sometimes the most egregious and 
highly evidenced forms of transnational oppression occur that host country governments can actually legally do anything about it. Another example that a lot of people don't know about, but which I, when I discovered, I thought was absolutely wild, was a group of Libyan students who protested at the Libyan embassy in London in 1984 were actually shot at with a gun in the middle of London in broad daylight by an embassy official. And in so doing, this embassy official killed a British policewoman named Yvonne Fletcher. Now, this created a massive political and diplomatic fiasco that ended up, you know, expelling uh, British diplomats and basically contributed to Britain and Libya cutting ties for about 15 years. It wasn't the only thing that was going on at the time, but it was a major, major issue, just like Lockerbie was a major issue for Gaddafi across the UK and the US for a long time. Um, but, you know, it takes something like that. I mean, there were specific murders going on of, in the Libyan community. There was surveillance. Uh, even the ambassador was bragging about this. So the authorities were aware, but again, preventing it uh, is, is difficult. I think what is needed is more attention and training for our law enforcement, who I think you know, they kind of have this dual function with these communities. On the one hand, they're surveilling them uh, and profiling them and discriminating against them in the, in the context of the war on terror, which is not okay. And on the other hand, for geopolitical reasons and sovereignty reasons, they do want to protect them. They don't just want people being murdered all over the place willy-nilly by foreign regimes. Like that's not okay for them, both morally and because it threatens their authority. So I think what's needed is Unfortunately, there's not a lot of trust between these communities for, for obvious reasons, and you can't necessarily expect people to report. But we need some kind of agency or broker or somebody to be able to collect complaints and claims and be able to relay them to proper offices, either local law enforcement or national level law enforcement, to be able to help them, to be able to tell them what their options are, to be able to help them protect their computers better and their social media accounts better. Um, and I do know that the European Union recently passed um, a, a sort of something, a proclamation, I can't remember, something saying, you know, we recognize that the Chinese regime is persecuting Uyghurs not only in China, but in the diaspora. And that's absolutely not okay. And we will take measures to prevent that. We need more of that at a systemic level there. And the last thing I'll say about this is there have been a number of lawmakers in the United States who are states is the largest or the, um, the biggest uh, funder of Interpol out of any nation. They're very concerned about abuse of Interpol by Russia and by their geopolitical opponents. And so they are working to pass something called the TRAP Act, the Trans, uh, Transnational uh, Repression Accountability and Protection Act, I believe, uh, something along those lines, to actually recognize and combat the abuse of this institution for the purposes of transnational repression. So we're just starting to see a more systemic attention, I think thanks in part to research by, by co my colleagues and the attention it's getting from lawyers as well, uh, who are very worried about how this is impacting people's asylum claims. Um, Host countries, I think, are, are, are a lot of times, they do a good job of protecting very prominent exiles, but in terms of the rest of the community, people still tend to be subjected. So it's a big challenge. I do think that there's promise, but I do think that also law enforcement agencies need to demonstrate their goodwill to these communities. I mean, if these communities feel victimized and you know persecuted because of their race, their ethnicity, or their religion, how can we expect them to then lodge grievances about things that are, you know, kind of going on from their home countries when it's those very transnational ties that maybe implicate them in the war on terror, right? It's a like, very paradoxical situation. So I do think that a lot more effort needs to come from the top down. And it's something that myself and my colleagues are working to raise more awareness about so that lawmakers and lawyers have the tools to really advocate for these kinds of, these kinds of changes. Okay, thank you. We have a lot of questions here, so I'm gonna to try to uh, filter these a bit. So um, we have a question about initiatives to um, ensure that European taxpayers' money is not going to support the Syrian regime. Um, are, are, you, are you aware of such initiatives? I'm sure they exist, but I, I, about you know, using, using um, oversight of public funding, for example, and how the diaspora can ensure that we're not inadvertently um, even breaking sanctions. 
Well, that yeah, and that's that's a couple of points, right? One is about how do you pressure lawmakers to make sure that your money as a taxpayer, as a resident, isn't going to a corrupt regime, which unfortunately has been co-opting international aid for its own purposes, this entire conflict. So that is a huge issue, and it requires us to communicate to our lawmakers that we care about this, and we do not necessarily want aid of any kind going to the regime. Unfortunately, the regime is in charge of what aid gets in and where it goes, except that there are many diaspora organizations that are still working to channel aid to places that the regime is either neglecting or punishing. Okay, so what I suggest is for those of you who uh, you know care about refugees, care about those um, in these communities, find a Syrian run organization, um, Syria Relief, Syrian American or British Medical Societies, um, uh, books, not bombs. Um, uh, there are a lot of organizations, and if folks want to email me, I can I can send I can send you some names. Run by Syrians themselves who were born in Syria, forced into the diaspora, and are now working either in Syria to help or working in Turkey and places around the periphery to help with the refugee crisis. Um, but unfortunately. Uh, our governments are sometimes, they feel these conflicting pressures, right? Like on the one hand, they feel like I have to help the crisis. On the other hand, their partners in the crisis are authoritarian regimes. And I think that that's hugely problematic because they're using aid as a weapon against their own populations. Um, so yes, we should be attentive to that, but we can still do a lot to support, you know, Syrians and Libyans who are still working to channel aid where it needs to go and using every penny, I mean, really every penny uh, for people in need and not using a lot for overhead or what have you. Um, there are a lot of organizations still doing that based in Europe and in the United States. Okay, thank you. There was a, a question here that I think, I don't know if you have enough of, just based on your own data set, but about um, these practices of transnational oppression coming from um, democratic regimes. And if we're seeing similarities and differences in the actual, um, the way transnational oppression can be carried out by a democratic regime versus, versus an authoritarian regime. This is a great question and something that I'm looking forward to addressing more specifically in, in the forthcoming book I'm working on with Sapira, because we know that illiberal, illiberalism, authoritarianism is not just a regime, it's not a state, it's a practice. And any government, any authority can practice authoritarianism, whether or not we consider the government or the country to be authoritarian. So this is a hugely important point. Regimes, I, I wanna emphasize this in like capital letters, authoritarian regimes are assisted in transnational repression in all times and places by complicity, by Western-based, democratic-based corporations and governments. These are not two separate spheres, right? Like we've seen, for example, that the Gaddafi regime was rendering, kidnapping and rendering folks from the diaspora with the help of the US, Canadian, and Brit particularly the British governments around 2004 when Gaddafi was starting to warm back up to the international community. So once we establish you know, the, these kinds of common enemies in this war on terror, and, and I'm not saying there aren't real concerns and real threats, but what I'm saying is if regimes say, well, that person in the diaspora is a suspect in the war on terror, that person is a terrorist, you need to help us get him, then unfortunately, a lot of times regimes like play this game to get democratic governments either willingly or unwillingly to help them in this process. Now, in terms of transnational repression specifically by you know, the United States, Australia, Japan, or, or Britain, the way I define transnational repression is not just internationalized violence or repression, but the specific targeting of your citizens or your subjects overseas. And this is very much limited in the American and British case that I know of. One example though is for, is in one case, Amar al uh, uh, Anwar al was a Yemeni American guy who was a preacher in the DC area who became radicalized over time. And when he went to Yemen to sort of join jihad over there, the United States unilaterally under President Obama assassinated him in Yemen. And this created a big uproar because it was like, wait, yes, we know he was doing shady stuff with Al Qaeda, but can you just execute him like that without you know, any sort of legal hearing or without reading him his rights? Well, unfortunately, the jury's still out on that, but I would consider that a case of transnational repression. Again, I tend to focus on activists who are like unequivocally, you know, good guys. I mean, they're humanitarians, they're pro-democracy. 
But, and so Aulaki is a slightly different case and I don't wanna conflate the two, but certainly I think it's, it's the case that uh, democratic governments are complicit in this practice. They may practice it themselves, although they tend to have more legal uh, restrictions in doing so. There tends to be more publicity around these kinds of cases. So it's less likely to happen. I'm less likely to be persecuted for speaking out against my government if I go abroad than somebody from an authoritarian regime. And so where you have those ties, where your what, what, you, what your passport says really matters in terms of your voice in this world, not just locally, but globally. And I think that that's really important. But yes, it's definitely not just Russia or Iran or Egypt committing these kinds of acts. Absolutely not. Okay, thank you. And yeah, and um, yeah, there's a lot of cases of that indeed where we're seeing that um, the way we qualify a citizen abroad can change the way your own state will treat you um, um, and can be very troubling at times. Uh, we have a question about Egypt and using your own framework um, for transnational repression and what are the criteria for it and also when uh, diaspora communities can um, exit uh, or find their voice. Uh, what are the options for or possibilities for Egyptians in diaspora at this point? Oh gosh, this is an, a really interesting case. The diaspora in the first wave of the revolution, you know, those eight famous 18 days in 2011, didn't have a chance to play as much of a role. I mean, certainly they were trying to support what was going on, but the Egyptian people were pretty successful in, in quickly, uh, you know, pressuring Mubarak to leave. Uh, but that said, of course, since then, there have been several revolutions and several counter revolutions and Sisi has come to power and is, you know, by accounts by experts who know better than me, like Amy Austin Holmes and other e Egypt experts who, who were actually on the ground observing these processes over time, you know, Sisi is by all intents and purposes, the new totalitarian state and by certain metrics is even more repressive than Mubarak was during his time as imprisoned more people, tortured, you know, tortured more people, persecuted more people. So, so of course, this has created a new wave of exiles um, and also has made transnational repression, I think, a resurgent and particularly acute threat for Egyptians abroad right now, because the regime regime absolutely tolerates zero dissent, zero independent civil society, even compared to Mubarak, who is like terrible by his own standards. So I would say that there's a lot going on. The people who know best about this are some of my colleagues like um, Marcus Michelson, Jillian Kennedy. They are writing about the Egyptian case right now. And I would say that Egyptians are subject to the whole list, the whole gamut of transnational repression that I mentioned, and that the problem, there's, there, I mean, it's particularly acute, I think, that threat for them right now because of CC and because of all the support that CC has all over the world. Um, it's less likely that, you know, as CC warms up to all these other dictators and, you know, the Trump regime here and other people that Egyptians abroad are going to be protected. And that's a huge, huge problem. It's very concerning for that community. Okay, thanks. I think we have time for just maybe one more question. So I was going, there's a question about, um, you know, what, how does this operate and how are, how does it change when people are in diaspora in uh, neighboring countries, for example, or countries that um, either there could be maybe these can be very porous borders at times. Um, there can be maybe some, um, uh, there's more of a side taken in certain cases because of the, the relationship, the geopolitical relationship. So I, I, I know that your field work was primarily with diaspora communities in, in um, the global north, but I don't know if you have any um, evidence that you've been able to gather about this diaspora mobilization going on from neighboring countries. Absolutely. I'd say the closer you are to home, the more in danger you are as a rule. So we see a lot of this going on between Russia and the former Soviet republics. Uh, Alexander Betts and Will Jones, who are scholars in the UK, have talked about transnational repression of, you know, African communities uh, who are diasporas, you know, around South Africa. And this has been a huge issue. Uh, I would also say that I found that there were more murders of Syrians and Libyans happening in the 80s and 90s in Europe and in, of course, Lebanon, Turkey, Jordan, and places like that, even Iraq, than in the United States. 
I think that, you know, uh, porous borders, nearby borders, it's just easier to coordinate these things. And not every regime has the resources of the Saudis who are trying to send hit squads all the way to Canada now, um, which just came out in the news, uh, to do this kind of thing. I think the further away you are and the stronger the state and the, their sort of border regime, the more difficult it's going to be. Of course, like you said, this depends on geopolitical relationships, but uh, this is a huge problem. I mean, a lot of times the nearby state is the only place where people can find refuge in the immediate term. So you had the National Front for the Salvation of Libya in like the 1980s forming in Sudan. And then when they when their attack on Gaddafi was, was stopped, I think in 1984, you know, they first fled back to Sudan and then Egypt and then maybe got asylum abroad. But as people people don't necessarily just go home country, host country, the way that I'm sort of incidentally depicting it, right? They're trying to travel around it and get away and get far away. And I, I definitely think that it increases the capacity. You know, you're more likely to have regime agents in your backyard than you are, you know, thousands of miles away in, in Los Angeles or Tokyo. Okay, well, thank you so, so much, Dana, for this incredibly, um... Um, stimulating discussion over this past hour. Um, the recording of this will be made available uh, on our website. Um, I highly encourage people who are interested in this to look up uh, Dana's work, um, where she's able to go into a lot more details, including hopefully the upcoming book about the Yemeni diaspora, which we didn't have time to discuss today. And I will just announce the next uh, webinar in this series will be taking place on um, November 5th. And it will be looking specifically at the Libyan diaspora and about issues related to um, the in-betweenness that many of these Libyan diaspora communities are feeling, um, this liminal status, and how this is affecting their, their mobilization efforts. Um, this will be with Alice Alani and Huda Mzudet. Um, and I think a lot of these things we were just talking about, about the difference between being far away or being very close um, and how this is changing pe people's own perspectives of their own futures, uh, but also their, their parameters for movement. Um, I think those are definitely themes that we're gonna be taking up um, in our next webinar. So thank you very much. Thanks to everyone for being here. Um, I just wanna say too, if anyone has questions that I didn't get a chance to answer, you can email me, you can Google Dana Moss Notre Dame, or you can write down dmoss2 at nd.edu. So thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Bye.